friends, and welcome back, everybody. Happy Monday. It is the 22nd of June, 1998, and in the house tonight is Evelyn Keyes, one of the great stars of Gone with the Wind, which is now set for a dramatic re-release later on this week, and then Peter Funt, who is the co-host, along with our friend Suzanne Summers of Candid Camera here on uh, CBS. Let us welcome to the world Allison K. Uh, Mancinelli, uh, daughter of uh, Tim Mancinelli, our associate director, and his dear wife, Jill. She was born on Father's Day yesterday. Uh, she weighs in at nine pounds, four ounces, a large young lady. Congratulations to Jill and to Tim and Allison. Welcome to our world. Pictures later on this week, I'm sure. When I was a young man working in Georgia in uh, 1960, uh, the studios re-premiered uh, Gone with the Wind in Atlanta at the Fox Theater, where it first came to light back in 1939. And they, uh, they brought in all the stars, and the, uh, the producer of the picture, David O. Selznick, was there, along with, I believe, Vivian Lee, uh, Hattie McDaniel, uh, and uh, other uh, stars of the picture. I don't recall if Miss Keyes was there at the time. Olivia de Havilland was. And the television station for which I worked at the time, Channel 11, was the station that covered all of the events. This was a huge week in Atlanta. It was the uh, centenary of the start of the Civil War, the war between the states back in uh, 1860. And I had never seen Gone with the Wind until I was uh, in Atlanta in 1960 at the age of 24 or 25 years. And it's a stunning achievement in motion pictures. For the younger folks here tonight, if you have not seen this picture or if you've seen it on television, I beg of you go to a theater and see this in big screen and keep in mind that when this picture was made back in 1939 there were but six technicolor cameras in the world and all of them were used on gone with the wind uh, it was only three years after the introduction of color motion pictures it was a scant nine or ten years after the introduction of sound to motion pictures and how they put this picture together uh, in 1939 is indeed a miracle if you measure it against the technology of the time also keep in mind that Gone with the Wind was the book of its decade. It was written by Margaret Mitchell, who lived in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, who would later die in a car accident there in the 1940s. And this book was the most talked about book of, uh, of, uh, of its time. I can remember even in the 1940s, when I was cognizant of what books were, my parents talking about this wonderful work by Margaret Mitchell called Gone with the Wind. And keep in mind that this picture was done entirely in Culver City. They never went to Atlanta, never went to Georgia. It was all done with the technology, the special effects of, of its time. And it truly is a, uh, it's, it's a hallmark picture. It's, it, well, the other night on AFI, number four of all time, and many people put it as number one. And if you think Titanic was something based upon 1998 technology, go and take a look at uh, uh, Selznick and what these people did back in 1939 when they made Gone with the Wind. And as I say, when I lived in Georgia, I lived there for five years in my youth, there was hardly a family that I met uh, that was not touched by the Civil War, lost a son, lost a daughter, lost a home, uh, especially those people who lived in Atlanta and, uh, and in Savannah, and those who lived along the roads, uh, the route between those two cities when Sherman marched to the sea in the campaign that brought the war between the states to an end many, many years ago. So just forgive me, but I have a very special place in my heart for this picture and for the people who made it because I spent some time in my youth living in the city uh, that was the scene of its, uh, its greatest battle. Now, about Peter Fon the air. This week, motion picture history takes another giant step with the re-release of a new and improved version, technologically, of the Civil War epic called Gone with the Wind. It was almost 60 years ago that actress Evelyn Keyes joined Clark Gable and Vivian Lee and Hattie McDaniel and Olivia de Havilland and more in the motion pictures cast, and I'm pleased to welcome her to CBS tonight, and thanks for joining us. I can't wait to see your movie when it comes out in the, in the remastered version on big screen. I love that picture mm -hmm. more than I can say. This picture was unlike anything that had ever been done before when they yeah. started, huh? Yeah, yes, it was. No one had ever seen anything like that. And the, the, the color... Technicolor has, nobody's ever improved color over Technicolor. Mm -hmm. It was the best. And as I there mentioned is. at the time, I saw a documentary called The Making of Gone with the Wind. There were but six Technicolor cameras in the world at that time, and Selznick mm -hmm. had them all. <laughs> Talk to I me. didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Tell me about David Selznick here, because in this film that I saw, he truly labored. Uh, he, he almost killed himself David, making this picture. David O. Selznick made Gone with the Wind. Nobody else did. They helped him, it's true, but he did it. He was, 
I don't know when he slept, because it was as though he worked 24 hours mm -hmm. on the script, on the, the smallest detail. For instance, the uh, costumes we wore, right. the hoop skirts, everything, including our underwear that nobody ever saw, the pantaloons, all the way, the corsets, everything underneath, was made by hand because sewing machines weren't invented at the time of Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that the ladies who wore these hoop skirts yeah. were not able to sit down, so they would, ha they would have angled planks for you to rest against while, while you weren't filming, true? Well, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> My and advice, if you ever find yourself in a hoop skirt, don't try to sit down, I, I, unless you have something to lean back against. Miss Keys, I stopped wearing them years ago. <laughs> Wise move. <laughs> And what about the, uh, the, the, the dirt from Georgia, the red clay dirt? Uh, didn't they bring that into uh, to Culver City? Absolutely. Brought it in after the war when, when the, the O'Hara family was out in the fields picking cotton and mm -hmm. the clothes were getting old. The red dirt of Georgia was put on the bottom of the skirts and the sleeves. And then wasn't there trouble with the writing of the picture? It, seem, it seems I recall that there was, a writer was always being brought in to fix it, and then he would be fired, and Selznick would try somebody else, and it took forever to get it, uh, get it done. Everything was rewritten. I used to watch, because I was intrigued, uh, Vivian Lee. This is like my second picture. The first one, I, I, I just started. I came out, Cecil B. DeMille signed me to a personal contract, mm -hmm sent me to school on the Paramount lot uh, as, a, as a screen test, put, stuck me in a picture. I'd never acted in my life. Really? Yeah, no. And he put me in, and I was going, learning how on the Paramount lot, and gone with the wind started up. And as all the studios were sending people over there. And I got sent, too, because I had grown up in Atlanta. Oh, really? Yes. And DeMille, uh, First, the first thing he said when I came in, that southern accent has to go. You don't want to play southern girls all your life, do you? I said, no, sir. And that had been gotten rid of. But Gone with the Wind came along. <laughs> I went southern over. Southern accent comes in handy in Gone with the Wind. Huh? Well, they had to teach me how to do it again. <laughs> they had a coach for everybody, for Swartnick, for Vivinley. And DeMille said, you go over there, and if you don't get the part, I'll have to shoot you at sunrise. So... I had to get the part. Right. So, you, so you went over, you read for Sue Ellen? I read uh, for, for Sue, uh, well, yes, they, it had to do with appearance too, because mm -hmm. they have, if you leave, uh, being playing the sister, I had to, had, I don't know what Selznick was looking for, but it was enough that uh, I didn't get shot at sunrise. And what was it like on the sets while this picture was being made? What, oh, what, this what, is what, what I started, because uh, uh, you you talking about being written, uh, written all this. I was fascinated to watch Vivian, playing Scarlet, who had the most dialogue, of course. I mean, she's the star. To get these scenes new, it seemed to me every day, would look at them once, put it down, and know them, and become Scarlet right there in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, because it was it was daily, daily, and that is sad. It was David watching, 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 seeing that it was everything was done right. Now, you told me that you're from Atlanta. Did you grow up there? I grew up there. So you grew up in Atlanta during the time of segregation, no doubt. When you were a little girl at Georgia, it was a segregated state, huh? I, I, totally segregated. Desegregation didn't come, what, till the 60s? 60s? Was it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, certainly, I didn't know any different. That's all I knew. And what about when you came to California? Well, it, 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 it still was. I mean, even on Gone with the Wind, it's, it's so sad. It breaks my heart to have to tell you, because, but I didn't know any better mm -hmm. then. Uh, as you know, the, there were blacks in the, in the, in the picture Absolutely. actors. Absolutely. Hattie McDaniel, Butterfly McQueen. And, and uh, Hattie won a, an Academy Award. I know she part. did, and I have, a video, I have a videotape at home that they show her accepting her award. Which you know where I was there. Do you know where she had to sit? No. Over on one side? Really? And, and when I thought back, I didn't think of it at the time since I had come from a segregated uh, 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 place. I guess the whole country was. I, di I didn't think at all. Uh, 
I don't remember eating a lunch or any meal because when we were on a location, you know, out in the outside, never having a, a, a black person at the, at, at the lunch at, table. At right. the lunch table. So uh, Eddie Anderson and Butterfly McQueen and Hattie McDaniel probably uh, ate somewhere at, off to the side. Isn't it awful? I have no idea where they sat. It makes me it makes me so sad. And as you say, uh, you, you know, uh, the entire country was segregated at that time. I mean, That's the right. South. They, That's I, right. I, I grew up in Milwaukee. We didn't have uh, restrooms for white and colored, as it yes, was called then. Colored, yes. But uh, the Negroes at that time in Milwaukee, as in, in my youth, we did not see them on the streets in our neighborhood or in restaurants because they lived in one part of town. Well, another part of town. And it was just taken for granted that that's where they wanted to live, which was far from the truth at the time. But as kids growing up, we didn't know. How do you know? How do you know? But I learned differently. Now, in 1939, you all go to Atlanta for the premiere of the picture. Yes. And I've seen film of this. You're there, Clark Gable. Uh, I, I, in fact, I have film of you on the, on the podium being introduced by the mayor of Atlanta, William B. Hartsfield, at the time. At, at that time, my name wasn't just Evelyn Keyes. It was Atlanta's own Evelyn Keyes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> It was never by itself. <laughs> You're right. In fact, wasn't it Atlanta's own Clark Gable and Atlanta's own, or no, Atlanta's own, uh, right, Evelyn Keyes, because no, you were born no, and brought up there. Because right? I was from there. Right. No, no, no. They... But I remember you, kid, walking up there, William B. Hartsfield, here she is, Atlanta's own. <laughs> Atlanta's and you walked out own. and you got a big cheer and, uh, from the crowd. Well, I was one of them. <laughs> and then I remember Clark Gable saying, you know, that Atlanta, uh, Hartsfield had told him that Atlanta was a city of 300,000 people. I guess there were three million people in Atlanta for the premiere of that picture in 1939. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Oh, yes. And they were walking around out there in uh, dressed in hoop skirts and, and uh, Confederate uniforms. Right. And, and then it. when the picture was over, I, I'm assuming that you went to the premiere in the Fox Theater. Oh, absolutely. What happened when the picture came to an end, when the end came up on the screen? I think there was stunned silence for a moment. Yeah. Everybody was just awed. And then slowly the applause started and then there were, there were tears. There were, I yeah. mean, it was just one big emotional yeah. Yeah. happening there. Yes. They were really almost overcome, the whole audience. Oh, I know. Hey, the picture is yeah. overwhelming, especially to yeah. people who lived in Atlanta. And as, yeah. I, as I said to the folks in starting here, when I lived there, yeah. All the people that I met in Atlanta who were from Georgia, yeah. their families were touched by the war between the states. Yes, to, you know, yes. and, and, and the wounds to this day are yes. still there. I have to pause for the sponsors and our stations. We're chatting with Evelyn Keyes, one of the stars of Gone with the Wind that has been remastered and re-premieres this coming weekend. We'll be right back after this break. Texas, hello. Hello, Hello Mr. There. Snyder. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Thanks for making it, Nancy. What's on your mind tonight? I would like to ask Mrs. Keyes if um, any, I know that uh, it, Vivian Lee was known to have had some mental or emotional problems, and I wondered if any of those were evident during the filming of the film, uh, Gone with the Wind. No, they weren't evident. I mean, no one knew about it. I, all, all that came out later. I learned it when you learned it. But... I believe that that turmoil helped her be a marvelous Scarlet, because oh. Scarlet was in turmoil all the time. I don't doubt that one bit, because she was marvelous, and so were you. And thank you so much for taking my call, Tom, and thanks for the many, many hours that you've given me of pleasure. I really appreciate it. Nancy, thanks a million. Have a nice evening and be at peace, okay? I will. Say uh, hello to, Grant, to your mother for me. I shall indeed. I'll see her tomorrow or Wednesday. Good deal. All right. Good night, Nancy. Thank you. I've got just a little snip here of Gone with the Wind. I think this is uh, the, uh, the scene with you and Vivian Lee and Hattie McDaniel, something about a dress or, or, or some such thing. And I'm sure you'll recall it when you see it. Here is uh, uh, Evelyn Keyes, uh, Vivian Lee, Hattie McDaniel, and just a bit of the great Gone with the Wind. How is Ashley today, Scarlett? He didn't seem to be paying much attention to you. You mind your own business. <laughs> You'd be lucky if you don't lose old Whisker Face Kennedy. You've been sweet on Ashley for months, and his engagement's going to be now tonight. Pa said so this morning. That's as much as you know. Miss mm. Scarlett, mm. Miss Sue Ellen, you all behave yourself. Act like poor white trash children. <laughs> <laughs> 
me ask I you. I, it's been so long, I, I forgot about that. Well, yeah. there you are, Atlanta's own, huh? Yeah. Let me ask you about Hollywood in the 30s and 40s, because, you know, you, 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 were, you were here then and you, you knew what was... Actors and actresses got into trouble back then, just as they do now, in terms of public peccadilloes. But people didn't know about it because the studio heads kept it quiet, huh? That's right. I'm sure they did. Uh, yes, they were whispered around. You wouldn't even know if they were true or not. Mm -hmm. You thought maybe somebody's just saying something, you know, uh, mean. Because, first of all, the studios disappeared. In the days of the studio, you belonged at that place. Paramount, I mean, DeMille. I had a bungalow there, and he had his own, so he owned me. Well, he was, he was an empire unto himself, wasn't Unto he? himself, and I have, I was, had been the baby of my family. I was the only one under contract to him. So, I did, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you get, you're protected in every way. I mean, they're being, they shaped your clothes, what, how your voice sounds, everything. Who you went out with, who you saw. Huh? And then, well, I was at Columbia for <coughs> 11 years, ha Harry Cohn. If he saw my name in the paper with some, but he, well, some man that he didn't approve of, I'd get called in. What are you doing with so-and-so? You know, and, and they, would they shake their finger at you just like that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big daddy. Yeah. Big daddies, all of them. Did you hate it? Yes and no. I always felt if I got really in trouble in the middle of the night, all I had to do was call Harry Cohen and he'd come fix it. Mm -hmm. I felt that protected, too. Sure, you don't like to be... I cared about somebody once in a while. I didn't want to hear that I wasn't supposed to go out with him. Right. So I'd go in and we'd have a little fight and I'd stamp my foot. <laughs> You've had some great loves in your life, haven't you? Yeah. Mike Todd. Yeah. John Houston, mm -hmm. Artie Shaw. Yeah. Yeah. Was there, why, why these men? These are all powerful men, uh, romantic men. Well, I have. I Mike have, Todd, larger I, than life. They were all larger than life. I, I've been in psychoanalysis and I could explain it all to you, but you don't want to hear all that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'll tell, let me see if I could tell you in one sentence. My father died when I was, uh, I think, uh, 18 months old. Really? I don't remember, of course, but I'm told, he, it was late in life, he was in his 50s, my mother was in her 40s, and he loved this new little baby that arrived. I could do no wrong. As I say, I've, I had it made for the first 18 months in my life. Right. I loved, kid, couldn't cry, he picked me up, right? So, and then he vanished. So I had to pick strong, men who would get out of the way too, who would disappear. <laughs> if they didn't disappear, I helped them along. Well, what, what do you mean by disappear? Why would they have to disappear? Because that's what my father did. Oh, I got you. Okay, okay. Eight, he died. I mean, you can't explain that to an 18-month-old. No, you can't. Or to a five-year-old little girl. Though, when, when, when she realizes her father left when she was 18 months old, she doesn't know why, right? But she, he disappeared. Right, he vanished. Right. So in your so that's my pattern. Yeah, in your life, after a while, they disappear. Do you do you ever see them again after they disappear? I that was the difference. We all remain marvelous friends. Good. We, Good. <laughs> for the, all, always. I, when I was living in Paris later, John was there, and we were friendly again. Yeah. Friendly again, as you said. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it at that. That's good. We were friendly again. And what about like the long-term Hollywood marriage? We read, of, we read of couples that are married for 30 and 40 years in Hollywood. Well, they know how, don't you see? I never, I, I have a theory. I think people who make that grew up with one, saw one, a marriage. I never saw a marriage. I only saw my mother. I, know, I wouldn't know what a marriage is. I, w I don't know how. And I also picked men who didn't know how. I, I realized, I didn't know at the time I was in charge, but I was. Yeah, yeah. And then what were your politics back then? Were you a liberal person back then, conservative person? Growing up in the South? No, oh, yeah. That was pre-segregation. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when you got to Hollywood, after you'd been out here for a while. Uh, th it was segregated, too. Segregation didn't really happen. Well, what about what? when the, uh, the, the Congress came after Hollywood, the House Committee on Un-American Activities? When people That's had... later. That, you know, I was married to, to, to John Houston. Mm -hmm. He and a writer called Philip Dunn organized a committee called the Committee for the First Amendment, which is freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. 
organized this committee and we chartered a, a plane and flew to Washington. And in a mass, I'm talking about stars, Bogie, Bogart, and Bacall, and Catherine Hepburn, Danny Kaye. I'm talking about big stars. Top stars, right? Top stars, and in a body, we moved in to that committee where they were pounding writers and saying they were commies mm -hmm. pinkos. or pinkos. Yep. They use all those words. And uh, John and it was Philip Dunn was the writer. They they spoke to the press and they were rather unpleasant too. That those were bad times. Mm -hmm. Very bad times. Very bad. Very times. bad times. And they could happen again. So. Did the government ever retaliate against those people who spoke out against the activities of the uh, House Committee? Sent them to jail. Some of them were sent to jail. Oh, you mean in our committee? Yeah. No, they didn't, uh, well, they would follow them around and give them a hard time. They stopped uh, uh, Bogey, Bogart on the way back from Washington. He stopped off in Chicago for some reason. It's been so long, I don't know. Oh, that's okay. I'm a, this is not a memory what, test, Ms. Keith. Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stopped him, the FBI, and had a word with him. And whatever it was, it was scary words, in other words. Mm -hmm. And I speak, I believe they spoke to John. Too. I heard that like, sometimes uh, actors and actresses had passport problems, you know, where they, people would be detained. Uh, yes. I did not, but uh, they gave me one once. I was going over, I wasn't with John anymore, I was with Mike Todd, he was in Europe. I was going John to, had disappeared, right? He had disappeared. And uh, Mike Todd's turn, and he was in Europe. He was going to make a, uh, whatever, he was going to make a picture, War and Peace to be exact. And uh, uh, I, so I got a, passport and they gave it to me for like a number of weeks, mm -hmm. five weeks or something. And well, I, well, I was going to be there longer. So I was in New York, went to the passport place, said, look, I, I, th this must be corrected. I must have the regular passport. He went off with my passport and came back. And I remember this man, I think he was about 10 feet tall and uniform. And he looked down at me and said, you've been a bad girl, haven't you? Uh-oh. And I was a woman then, uh -huh. I wasn't a girl. Right. And I gave you to, 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 and he asked me, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And well, I had not, and done anything, go vote and uh, go to this, on American activities right. thing, committee thing. That was it. Somehow, Mike got into the act, that's right, he knew somebody in Washington, and he called his friend in Washington and got, got my passport, but it had to be... All's well that ends well, but you had to go through but, this but, nasty 12-foot guy. But strings had to be pulled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That guy, you know, you've done a bad thing, haven't you? Well, there's a little Harry Cohn in all of us, isn't there? <laughs> it's a joy to yes, see you. Yes, come to think of it, I did get called a bad. <laughs> Bad girl. I know that so you're going to the uh, premiere uh, at the uh, at the Academy Theater on Wednesday. I hope that you enjoy seeing uh, Atlanta's own on the big screen. And thank you for joining us tonight. A pleasure. My pleasure. Evelyn Keyes is the guest. The picture is called Gone with the Wind, a classic of our time. It re-premieres this Friday. If you haven't seen it, young folks, do not miss this one. Next, Peter Funt from Candid Camera as we continue after this break. <laughs>